Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of the History Guy Podcast is brought to you by Magellan TV a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, the History Guy talks about two historic fruits, the banana and the orange. Both have interesting and long histories connected with humankind. We also have a special guest this episode in the History Guy's mom and my grandma, who joins us to chat about fruit and history. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. Here's an interesting trivia question. Do you happen to know what item is most sold at Walmart? I'll give you a hint. It's a berry that grows from an herb, or if you come from the United Kingdom, a herb. Here's another hint. The herb is in the family Musicae, and the most popular version of this berry is called the Cavendish. And if you still don't know, does it help to know that it was among the first fruits to be domesticated by humans? That it is so historically important that empires have been built on it and governments overthrown because of it? And that comedians have made entire careers slipping on its peel? The history of the banana deserves to be remembered. Currently, the scientific thinking is that the first fruit to be domesticated was the fig, with examples found in the archaeological record in the Jordan Valley as early as 9400 BC. A few other fruits, notably the bottle gourd, which is cultivated not for food but because the dried fruit produces a useful container, may have also been domesticated before the banana. But some scientists estimate that the banana was domesticated as early as 8000 BC. And there's written evidence that the cultivation of bananas had reached India by 6000 BC. Thus, bananas were possibly domesticated at approximately the same time as rice and potatoes, predating the domestication of apples by millennia. Bananas are herbaceous plants from the genus Musa in the family Musicae. The plants are not technically trees because their apparent stems, actually pseudo-stems, are not woody but are made up of leaf stalks. In fact, the plants may initially have been domesticated for their fibers, for weaving, rather than for their fruit. The banana fruit is produced from the ovary of a single flower, in which the outer layer of the ovary wall develops into an edible fleshy portion. Thus, bananas are, by the botanical definition, a berry. In the wild, they are an important food source for wildlife, and are a pioneer species that exploits newly disturbed areas, for example, after a fire. There are more than a thousand species of wild banana in Southeast Asia, China, and the Indian subcontinent, producing a staggering array of fruits. The Musa Valentina, for example, produces a bright pink fuzzy banana, and the Go Sung Hang species is so aromatic that its Chinese name literally translates as, you can smell it from the next mountain. While bananas were likely first domesticated in Southeast Asia or Papua New Guinea, Arab traders carried bananas back home and introduced the fruit to the Middle East in the 1st or 2nd millennium BC, and then took the fruit to the east coast of Africa. The fruit was then traded across the continent, eventually being cultivated in Western Africa. The introduction of the banana to Africa occurred so long ago that parts of Africa have become secondary centers of genetic diversity. In fact, there are two competing stories for the etymology of the word banana. One posits that it comes from the Arabic word banana for finger, because early bananas would have been about the size of your finger. The other posits that the word was derived from a West African language. In 327 BC, Alexander and his armies discovered the banana during one of their campaigns in India, and introduced the delicious fruit to the Western world, particularly to Mediterranean countries. In the 6th century, the Portuguese discovered bananas on the Atlantic coast of Africa, and then they then cultivated the fruit on the Canary Islands, and from there it was introduced to the Americas by Spanish missionaries. Early cultivated bananas would not have been like what we buy at the supermarket today. Rather, wild bananas are full of seeds, hard enough to break your tooth, and would have been smashed and sieved to eat the soft fruit. Over time, farmers would have selected those bananas that had fewer seeds, but such bananas eventually would become so seedless that they could not be grown from seeds and the plants had to be reproduced asexually. Small bulbs grow out of the plant's rhizome underground, called the corm. 
These small bulbs growing out of the rhizomes are also called suckers, and they grow to become banana plants. Instead of planting seeds, the suckers are harvested from a plant and used to grow more plants, which are essentially clones of the parent. Cultivation led to hundreds of edible varieties, but few were suitable for mass importation. The banana-rich culture we have today, the average American eats 28 and a half pounds of bananas each year, was the product of the 19th century. While bananas were being cultivated in plantations in the 15th and 16th centuries, those were red or green bananas that included a lot of starch and today would be called plantains. For the most part, they had to be cooked to be softened and eaten. In 1936, a farmer in Jamaica named Jean-Francois Peugeot discovered a banana plant on his plantation that, the result of random genetic mutation, was producing yellow bananas. The fruit was naturally sweet and soft enough to be eaten without cooking. This banana grew in tightly packed bunches and had a thick peel that resisted bruising, facilitating transport. Hundreds of cultivars of this banana mutation have evolved to give the world one of the greatest food breakthroughs in history supplying the world with the number one fruit grown to feed Earth's population, the modern yellow banana. The banana, originally called the Martinique banana, was so popular that the variety was cultivated all along the Caribbean coast in Central America. That type became known as the Gros Michel, or the Big Mike, and it was a game changer. Americans had seen bananas imported from Cuba early in the 19th century, but those were seen as merely a novelty. Likewise, bananas had been displayed in London in the 1600s, but again, the fruit was little more than an oddity. Economic and dietary changes, combined with the characteristics of the Gros Michel, created a massive trade. Imports into the U.S. gradually increased, especially at the end of the Civil War, but interest in imports really took off in the 1870s. In 1871, banana exports to the United States were valued at around $250,000. By the first year of the 20th century, the banana trade had exponentially ballooned to $6,400,000. Ten years later, it had effectively doubled again. So many bananas were imported onto the docks at the tip of lower Manhattan that the old slit piers became known as the banana docks. Fast, sometimes refrigerated boats built especially to carry bananas without spoiling were called banana boats. At one point, the United Fruit Company, now known as Chiquita Brands International, had the world's largest private fleet. The Big Mike facilitated the worldwide banana market and created the American and European love for the fruit. In 1904, a 23-year-old apprentice pharmacist at Tassel Pharmacy in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, named David Evans Strickler, invented the banana-based triple ice cream sundae, better known as the banana split, one of America's most popular desserts. The banana in that split was a Big Mike. And then a banana crisis. The Gros Michel had become a classic example of a monocrop. Big Mikes were grown from thousands of genetically identical plants. That allowed a specialization that facilitated mass production and distribution, but it revealed a vulnerability. If one tree was susceptible to a pest or blight, they all would be. That blight came in the form of Fusarium oxysporum, a fungus that caused the banana plant to rot with what is commonly called Panama disease. The blight was first identified in the 1870s, and the Gros Michel was particularly vulnerable to the blight. By the 1950s, it had spread all over the banana-producing world. The blight was so virulent that it caused the complete eradication of production on 30,000 hectares of plantation in the Ula Valley of Honduras between 1940 and 1960. In Suriname, an entire operation of 4,000 hectares was out of business within eight years. And in the Capos area of Costa Rica, 6,000 hectares were destroyed in just 12 years. As suddenly as it has risen, the banana market crashed. Some claim that the decline of the Big Mike inspired the popular song, Yes, We Have No Bananas. First recorded in 1923, the song was the single best-selling piece of sheet music for many decades. The solution to the problem came from an unexpected source, Derbyshire, England. In 1834, the Duke of Devonshire received a shipment of bananas from the Indian Ocean island of Mauritius. The Duke's friend and chief gardener, Sir Joseph Paxton, cultivated the bananas in the greenhouse at Chatworth House, the Duke's home in Derbyshire. Paxton named the variety Musa Cavendishi, named after the Duke, William Cavendish. The variety was then cultivated in the Canary Islands and commercially cultivated by 1904. But the Cavendish could not compete with the Big Mike, which had a better flavor and a thicker peel that made it easier to ship. But the Cavendish turned out to have one great advantage. It was resistant to Fusarium oxysporum. 
Because it was not as hardy, the Cavendish could not be as easily shipped in the natural cluster like the Gros Michel. The clusters had to be broken into bunches and then boxed, making the Cavendish more costly to ship. Still, Cavendish bananas represent nearly half of the bananas produced in the world today, and nearly all of the export market. If you buy a banana outside the tropics, it is almost certainly a Cavendish. Although it may surprise some people to know that you are not buying the same type of banana that your grandparents ate. The banana trade is so lucrative that it has driven more than a century of politics, especially in Central America and the Caribbean. American-based companies corrupted local governments in order to obtain exclusive production rights and ran huge swaths of Central American countries as virtual corporate nations, so-called enclave economies that contributed little to the host economy. Economic exploitation gave rise to violent labor movements, which drew the United States government, eager to advance its economic and military interests, into a series of conflicts throughout the region. Although the wars were not exclusively driven by the economic demands of the fruit companies, the series of conflicts became known as the Banana Wars. The term encompassed the Spanish-American War, the 1916-17 punitive expedition against Pancho Villa in Mexico, a 19-year occupation of Haiti that has been described as America's Black Vietnam, and dozens of other interventions. The nation of Honduras alone saw the insertion of American troops in 1903, 1907, 1911, 1912, 1919, 1924, and 1925. In 1911, a private army financed by the Cayamel Fruit Company orchestrated a coup d'etat in Honduras over a conflict with rival United Fruit Company for an exclusive contract for Honduran bananas. The unstable economies and governments caused by these interventions led American writer O. Henry to coin the term Banana Republic. Perhaps the low point of the intrusion by the American fruit companies came in Colombia in 1928, when the government of Colombian President Miguel Mendez, under pressure from both the United Fruit Company and the U.S. government, sent army troops to quell a strike by workers on the company's banana plantations. The troops fired machine guns into a crowd of workers, killing between 800 and 3,000 in what became known as the Banana Massacre. Under the administration of Franklin Roosevelt, the U.S. shifted to what was called the Good Neighbor Policy, reducing these interventions but not eliminating them. In 1954, the United Fruit Company portrayed labor reforms in Guatemala as a move towards communism, prompting the Eisenhower administration to orchestrate a covert operation of the CIA to overthrow the elected president. The United States and the European Union engaged in a trade complaint over bananas through the World Trade Organization for more than 20 years. The EU used tariffs to favor trade to former European colonies, which disadvantaged bananas from other countries, harming U.S. fruit company interests in those nations. The U.S. and five other countries filed a complaint with the World Trade Organization and, after the EU defied a WTO ruling, imposed tariffs on a range of EU agricultural products. Eventually, the EU agreed to eliminate the preferential tariffs. The dispute was one of the longest and most contentious in WTO history. Today, the banana is the world's fourth major food behind rice, wheat, and milk. Americans alone eat more than 3 million tons of bananas each year, more than apples and oranges combined. While the people of the U.S. and Europe almost exclusively eat Cavendish bananas, hundreds of local varieties are grown in the tropics. Bananas are cultivated in more than 170 countries and play an important role in the economy of developing countries. Of the nearly 80 million tons of bananas produced around the world, less than 20% are exported. The rest are eaten locally. There are many places in Sub-Saharan Africa where people eat bananas and little else. According to Islamic tradition, bananas are the food of paradise, and if you're ever in a tropical country, it's worth your while to check out the local bananas. But we all might again soon be singing, yes, we have no bananas, as the Cavendish is proving vulnerable to mutated strains of Panama disease. Once again, the world's export bananas are tied to a single species, and that supply is under threat. In 2016, CNN described the new blight as a banana crisis. The answer might come in the form of genetically modified Cavendishes, or even the return of the Big Mike, as scientists have been trying to breed a fungus-resistant version of the Big Mike ever since the first blight took hold in the 1900s. Or perhaps a new banana will rise to become king of the export market, and once again we'll have to get used to a new banana. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. We've got a special guest today on the podcast, and I'll let her introduce herself. 
Hi, I'm uh, I'm the mother of the history guy and the grandmother of the of, of the podcast guy, and really proud to be here today. I'm visiting in uh, at the studio today, and we are going to talk about interesting fruits. Absolutely. So we've got we've got a couple of interesting stories on uh, fruits. I think these are these are actually kind of some of my favorite episodes because they're completely unexpected. <laughs> I th these are everyday things that we don't we don't think about having deep histories, but I think both of them, bananas and oranges that we're talking about today, end up having a really surprising ties to all kinds of different history. I wanted to ask what what brought you uh, to the story of bananas because I'm pretty sure you wrote this one, right? Yeah, I did write one, and yeah, I, I think that I actually just saw just bumped into something somewhere that said that the bananas that our grandparents ate were a different kind of banana. Uh, and that got me into go and research exactly why that was. And that is an interesting story. But I mean, bananas in terms of uh, banana republics and then all we've done for the economics of uh, of the industry are actually quite interesting. There was just a lot more interesting stuff in the research than I wrote, which you always learn so much on these. Uh, and I do like the it's not just that they're unexpected and you don't think of fruit as, as history. But I mean, food is part of history. And honestly, if you think about it from your you know day to day life, what you're eating for lunch is actually usually more compelling to you than whatever's in the in the headline news that day. They're great, and there's a lot of uh, and there's more to talk about. We've talked about quite a bit, and I think there's a lot more to talk about. Uh, but it's how amazing that bananas are the, are the number one item sold at Walmart. They sell more bananas than any other item at Walmart. I didn't I didn't know that, and that's that's kind of interesting in and of itself. But I, I agree. I had heard about the. The, that there was a different kind of banana because I've heard it as an explanation. I don't know 100% if this is true. The idea that like banana flavoring doesn't taste like bananas because it's actually based on this other banana. I, I don't know how accurate that is. I, won't I didn't catch that, that in the but, research. We didn't put that's not in the, in the episode. So. <laughs> um, I've, I've heard that, but it's, I mean, I've always liked bananas and it's kind of an interesting story to think that they, uh, I feel like that just went complete, almost completely overlooked. Very nearly, bananas went extinct. Very nearly, they were, were not going to be a cash crop anymore, and none of us would know what bananas are. And, and really, this, this odd coincidence that this one cultivar had been developed in England, uh, and that that cultivar ends up being the one that is resistant enough to the fungus that we can continue producing bananas. But we produce them differently. They look different, and they, and they taste different, and, it's, and that's, that's really interesting. I had a, if you watch the video of that one, uh, you see that there, we've got some really good clips in there from, a, from an old 1920s documentary about how they're how they're raising yeah. and, and transporting bananas uh, and it's interesting because the whole process changed i mean that they they processed the the, the roche michelle differently than you have to process the cavendish and i even had uh, a fun story out back way out back like 700 miles from the closest grocery store if you fly into a station in australia uh, on a cattle ranch uh there will be a there'll be bougainvilleas and there'll be banana trees no, and, and basically, like I said, bougainvilleas and so forth, but uh, you've got a little well there and so forth, and the, and the ladies that are running the household. But just think, if you can't shop but once every six, every six months, and you have to do it with an airplane, then you raise what you can. And so I was amazed to see that they actually served bananas at the table, and, but they actually came from their own garden. Huh. That's incredible. Yeah, I had no idea that that's, you're, you're in a, the outback of Australia, and they're still getting you bananas, and they're straight from the uh, straight from the vine, as it were. <laughs> um, yeah, I I just think I mean that kind of stuff is really interesting, especially because almost no one knows it. I don't I don't know I don't physic I don't know physically how different the uh, the Big Mikes looked from the Cavendish ones. Yeah, I mean, the most important part is the Big Mike had thicker skin, and so it could be sent as a whole a bunch. It didn't have to be broken. Uh, but uh, it is uh, a Cavendish is a little bit longer and a little bit straighter. A big mic is going to be a little bit shorter, a little bit more curved, uh, and it's a little larger around. So they do. I mean, you can tell when you look at them that they that they, they look different. Yeah, but they're both they're both yellow bananas. That's just that's just really cool. It's just one of those things that you that I wonder if people people must have noticed it at the time something that the bananas changed a little bit, but it just doesn't. Well, seem I'm like sure they noticed at the time of the switch, but I mean it's weird that yeah, it seems yeah. to have been forgotten. If you I mean you can still find the Gros Michel still out there. I mean they, you know it didn't go extinct, uh, and you can still occasionally find those if you've got a place that's got a, you know a, a wide fruit selection, uh, and you know, see if you want to check out how the flavors are different. Yeah, they're just not the ones they focus on because. 
I mean, mostly because you just don't want your whole crop to be ruined by this. Well, I mean, yeah, they, yeah, they, uh, well, I mean, thousands and thousands of hectares of those were killed by the yeah, fungus. Yeah. And so there were a few places that, you know, there wasn't fungus there, but I mean, no one's going to want to commit economically to it. But they have been, uh, since this occurred, they have been trying to breed a gross Michel cultivar that is resistant to Fusorium oxysporum. So, uh, it's, uh, maybe, you know, it will come back or maybe it will be something like apples or pears where we have, multiple options in the store, which we, which none of us have had in our lifetime. But if you're in Europe or uh, or down on the islands and so forth, uh, when you walk in a store, you'll find three or four or five different kinds of bananas or big planktons or things that we don't know how to do. A lot of them, you actually peel them and then fry them. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, know, plantains, they're starchy. I mean, yeah. so most of the cultivars of banana are actually not sweet. I mean, the, the, so the sweet, soft, yellow banana was a, was a unique thing that occurred in... in uh, uh, Somewhere, I think it's in there, Martinique, I think is where it first appeared. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe the Cavendish is growing in somebody's greenhouse. Uh, and so, uh, but most bananas in the world are not necessarily like what we expect as bananas in America. Gosh, that's, and it's, it's just one of those things that we don't think about. And that's why, I mean, that's part of what I think is so thought provoking about these kinds of stories. I think that we, I think that another one of the interesting parts, especially about the bananas is, you know, we talk about lots of different ways that people fight over things. We fight over all kinds of, you know, land or resources or even religion, but bananas are usually not on that list. I think that we think of as something important. And I, that whole section of the story about what's going on in South America is an incredible, it's an incredible piece of history yeah. that I think they know somewhat down there, but we, I don't know that we necessarily think of that. The, the things that we call the banana wars weren't always just driven by bananas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly the war in Haiti wasn't a banana war, but I mean, it was similar in that we're talking about, you know, economic uh, uh, exploitation. Uh, and uh, but I mean they, they called the banana wars because these banana economies uh, were unstable economies and they were economies that were essentially run they would be corporate enclaves and so you'd have almost like a, a mini government within a government and much of the the money then that was being derived from that was not going back to the local economy so we literally did go fight wars over them and said it's that popular fruit it's got to it can't be grown much in the United States uh, or in Europe it's it's got to be grown in tropical areas. Uh, and then that ended up skewing the economy to the point where we were literally overthrowing governments. Like literally, there was there was one point where you had armies from two rival banana companies fighting over the control uh, of of government, uh, and and you know there's nothing else in the middle. And and then the the banana massacre. Uh, I mean, it was it really is very interesting uh, that anything of economic value can then lead to conflict. That's just and bananas are so sweet. I would wish that we didn't fight over him, but here we go. <laughs> here we yeah, are. they were. I uh, have the, if we didn't. The trade was disrupted in the Second World War, and there, you know, there's some discussion about how they, uh, it had become very popular in the United Kingdom, and during the Second World War, you couldn't get bananas, and I mean, those, those were, they were more valuable than silk stockings. I guess, I mean, that makes sense, yeah, it'd be hard to get to get a banana all the way to England when you're busy uh, fighting the Nazis, that's... Yeah. Yeah. And nowadays, uh, if you go to the doctor as a little old lady, and I can testify to this, then the first thing they're going to say is one of the things they recommend is that because bananas are, are so valuable as far as, far as potassium, uh, that it's recommended for every every little old person in the world. So they, they're still famous, and they're also medicinal. 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 You're supposed to have a banana a day? Uh-huh. You're supposed to have a banana a day. Keep the, keep the doctor away. Uh, so. Yeah, I'll have the <laughs> potassium. Uh, seriously, seriously is something that uh, that older people don't produce. And so uh, they still have uh, even a value there. Wow. See, that's and that's just another thing that all of these things that bananas are able to tie to. And I think that that's just so – I think it really speaks to how interconnected – history really is with you know with other people with regions with uh, but i mean fruits. It, food is important and economy is important and uh, when you start tying those together then that ties to culture and then that's that's what connects humanity and that's what you know most wars are over you know economics most wars are over controlling an economic zone i mean much of the second world war was because uh, hitler wanted to control ukraine in order to grow enough food for a german empire and, and so it all it all ends up tying together. So that's why it's really interesting when you pick up something. And, and we've got so many of those on there. When you pick up something like bananas yeah. or dandelions. Uh, or, I mean, you know, we talk about some stuff that you, it really is surprising to say, well, how connected that is to human history. Chickens. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, chickens. Cats. Well, these are things, you know, 
cats yeah that was that was a great one too I was, uh, uh, most amazing thing and... about the cats is the fact that the fact that they the reason that uh that we have grain the reason that that uh that, that the ships actually could sail and so forth was the fact that they kept the, well, the cats the, ate the rats yeah. the cats ate the rats and so no it all ties together it's cool because i think i think we think about you know this like the global economy is something fairly new where we're where everything is interconnected but i mean even thousands of years ago we had bananas and oranges and cats and stuff that were traveling over the whole world and i mean you could find a cat as as easily in europe as in china even thousands of years ago and that's a, that's a really interesting yeah, bananas thing. went from southeast asia all the way across africa to the point where they are a staple food in parts of africa where they are not natural plant not native plants well i think you you mentioned too that they were they were discovered by like portuguese in africa which is not where they were native to originally yeah, oranges yeah 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 Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? Well, my mother's in town, so we sat down today and we watched uh, a, a great documentary called Royal Wreck of Gold. And it's about uh, people that are, are uh, trying to salvage gold from a shipwreck that occurred off of the coast of England uh, and, uh, in uh, 1859. And it's, it's really, I mean, there's so many things I love about Magellan. There's so many different things. This was actually in the travel section. Uh, but this, this wreckage was close to shore. Had it largely been already explored, but they're finding other spots, you know, and the guys continued looking for it. Had a whole lot of gold on board. It wasn't just that the shipwreck, it wasn't even just that they were searching out the shipwreck, but they find items down there. Then it goes back to Australia and tries to identify who on that ship this item would have belonged to and, and track their descendants, uh, which, which makes it it's just a really interesting bit of history. Well, and it's very interesting because one piece that they found was uh, was a snuff box, and it had a name on it, and they were so excited about it. But then when they checked the manifest, they found out that, would you believe, uh, he it didn't show that he was on the ship. And so now think about, did somebody steal it? Did somebody drop it? Uh, where in the world would you find in a shipwreck a snuff box with somebody's name on it, but you can't tell that the man was there? It's one of those things you love. Every single documentary on Magellan TV, they're just fascinating things that you didn't know fun or interesting or, or really just kind of change your perspective on the world. The ship was delayed leaving for a couple of days because they were the, the captain was trying to get more passengers to, to make it more profitable. And because it left those two days late, if it had left on time, it would have made it deliverable on time. But because it left two days late, it got caught in the storm of the century and they were, you know, the, the ship was battered to pieces uh, within sight of England. And that's, the, you know, that's history. That's, I mean, that is the drama of history. What have you been watching? So what I was watching this time is I've always had kind of a I get an interest in science and especially quantum physics. And mostly I'm interested in it because it's crazy and I don't quite understand it. So I was watching this. There's a couple of episodes. It's called Secrets of Quantum Physics. They're about hour long episodes. This episode was called Einstein's Nightmare. And it was all about understanding essentially how light works and how that's affected by quantum mechanics, which is abs it's just absolutely mind blowing. It was really interesting because he t he's able to talk about it very, th uh, very thoroughly. He uses a lot of uh, physical like metaphors and stuff like that to try to be like uh, or analogies to really explain how how this is working and why people at the time were like I don't I don't know how to deal with this or how we deal with it but then it also gets to talk about Einstein's big problem with quantum physics was that he thought it didn't work with relativity and while I wouldn't consider myself an expert on it but <laughs> I would say that if you're interested in this kind of stuff this is this is something to watch it's one of those awesome things about Magellan with 3,000 some documentaries and a new documentary has gone up every week is that you can, if you want to talk about science, if you want to talk about space, if you want to talk about true crime, if you want to talk about nature, or I think they just had Earth Week, uh, and of course all sorts of different kinds of history, there's just stuff there where you just learn all the time. And uh, absolutely, we love our subscription to Magellan TV. And if you are a listener or a subscriber to The History Guy, you can always get some deals. Sometimes it'll be something like a deal off an annual membership or a free month on at try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. Before The History Guy starts to talk about oranges, I'd like to add a little addendum to this conversation. I mentioned earlier that I had heard that the reason that banana flavoring doesn't taste much like a banana is because it was based on the Big Mike banana and not the Cavendish that we know and love today. However, that isn't quite true. Actually, the advent of banana flavoring, or banana essence, predates the wide availability of bananas. In 1851, banana flavoring appeared at the Crystal Palace Exhibition in London, using what we now know to be a chemical present in bananas, although that wasn't known at the time. In fact, 
The same chemical was widely used, especially in the UK, as a flavoring for pear candies. The false flavoring was advertised in the US as a flavoring for banana candies years before most people had ever tasted a banana. Just as interesting, while the flavoring was not based on the Big Mike, later study has shown that the Big Mike has more of that banana-tasting chemical than the Cavendish, so it very well might taste more like it. Around 75 million tons of oranges were commercially grown worldwide in 2018 and shipped to virtually every corner of the world. Orange tree is among the most popularly cultivated fruit trees in the world and like many other cultivates have been carried by humans around the world to be grown far from where they first originated. Oranges are now grown on six continents. And the history of oranges is unique and intimately tied to human civilization. And of course, not too many fruits can claim to be the namesake of a color. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Citrus fruits originated in Asia, likely in the southeast Himalayan foothills and surrounding area, according to a 2018 genetic study. The history of individual citrus fruits is complex, and it's unclear when precisely the fruits were domesticated, although they spread over Southeast Asia and even to Australia millions of years ago. They have been cultivated, first in India and then in China and elsewhere, for at least several thousand years. Genetic studies of sweet oranges have shown that they're a result of crossbreeding between pomelos and mandarins. Bitter oranges, similar in outward appearance but not in taste, are not eaten raw but are used for flavoring and in alcohol. The sweet orange seems to have come from a deliberate cross by ancient farmers. The first certain mention of the fruit appears in a Chinese source in 314 BC. The origins of the bitter orange are less clear and it may have arisen naturally. Linguistically, the word for orange came from an ancient Sanskrit word for the orange tree, naranga. This became the Persian narang and then the Arabic word for the bitter orange, narange. The bitter orange took its name across the world first, spreading westward with trade through India, Persia, and possibly the Mediterranean. In fact, several other citrus fruits seem to have spread even earlier. First, the citron, which 4th century BC Greek philosopher Theophrastus called a Persian apple, and several centuries later, the lemon. It is possible that bitter oranges reached Greece and Italy at this time, although it's not certain. The bitter orange was popular in medieval Muslim culture as a flavoring in medicine, and its flowers were used for perfumes. The Muslim Empire helped bring the bitter orange to North Africa and then into Spain. Growing bitter oranges became highly popular in Andalusia, especially in the city of Seville. The mythical founder of the city is Hercules, who supposedly founded it during his famous labors, just before he traveled to find golden apples, sometimes identified as oranges, because the Greek and Latin words for oranges translate to golden apples. By the 10th century AD, the bitter orange was planted widely in Andalusia, supported by a complex system of irrigation designed to sustain orange orchards. The issue of water and irrigation was so important to the region that it has continued to define the appearance of the land in the modern age. Oranges from Seville have become famous as the primary oranges used in British marmalade, and much of the modern crop of Seville oranges now go to satisfying the UK's demand. Oranges spread throughout the Mediterranean. The orange slowly made its way north. Though the etymology isn't perfectly clear, the word came to France as orange, and by the 12th century, the Middle English as orange. Sometime at the end of the 15th century or early 16th centuries, traders finally brought the sweet orange to the European table. The earliest found written reference to the fruit in Europe comes from Italy in 1471, and in 1475, the first distinction between a sweet and a bitter orange appears in a manuscript from Rome. In fact, oranges have a close relationship with the church in early modern Europe. Italian medieval tradition says that oranges were brought to Italy by St. Dominic of Guzman, the founder of the Dominican Friars, when he gifted a Spanish orange tree to Pope Innocent III in 1216, a tree supposedly grown from the same roots still remains at the convent of St. Sabina in Rome. In 1483, St. Francis of Paola went to the French court of King Louis IX to request help with an illness. The friar didn't eat meat or food derived from animals, prompting the king to request lemons and sweet oranges and muscadel pears and parsnips for the holy man who eats neither meat nor fish. The sweet orange was much more palatable and gained popularity among the wealthy in Europe. The discovery that citrus fruits could prevent scurvy made the fruit vital to sailing. As many as two million sailors died from scurvy during the age of exploration. This is why Columbus brought orange seeds with him on his journeys to the New World and may have planted them at Hispaniola in 1493. 
Ponce de Leon and other Spanish explorers brought oranges to Florida in the 1500s, and oranges were growing at St. Augustine, the first European colony in what would become the United States, by 1579. All of the explorers of this time brought oranges with them and planted the seeds on islands and at colonies wherever they went. One hope was that establishing orange groves along trade routes would help ensure an ample supply for ships. This brought oranges to Brazil, Mexico, and much of South America. Spanish missionaries brought them north into Arizona between 1707 and 1710, and Franciscans brought them to San Diego by 1769. If you've ever wondered which came first, the name of the fruit or the name of the color, then you'll be happy to know that the name of the fruit clearly came first. The fruit was called orange, or a similar word, by the 13th century throughout Europe, while the first appearance of the word orange for color, derived from the fruit, doesn't appear until after 1500. While linguists are not certain, most of them think that before 1500 there wasn't a word for the color orange at all, and Old English referred to the color simply as yellow-red. Back in Europe, the fruit continued to spread. The more northern climates of Europe were too cold for growing oranges, but that didn't stop the wealthy from finding a way to get their orange fix. The first orangery, a greenhouse built to protect fruits like oranges from the cold, was built in Italy as early as 1545. They became popular following the end of the Eighty Years' War in 1648, as countries like France, Germany, and the Netherlands began getting regular shipments of exotic fruits from Asia in the New World. By far the most impressive orangery was built by Louis XIV to house his thousands of orange trees. The Versailles orangery, completed in the 1680s, would remain the largest of its kind until modern greenhouses began to appear in the 1800s. The building wasn't just meant to house exotic trees, but to impress visitors and serve as a visual reminder of wealth and power. Orangeries were extensively decorated and meant to entertain guests. In the coldest months, fires would be lit inside to keep the temperature high enough. As he grew old, the king had orange trees put in silver pots throughout the palace to perfume the whole building with the scent of citrus blooms. Orange as a fruit and a color has an interesting connection to the famous House of Orange Nassau, still the royal house of the Netherlands. The German Nassau House inherited lands and political power in the Netherlands. René of Chalon Orange, son of the head of the Nassau House, took over his father's position as Stadtholder of Holland, Zeeland, and Utrecht in 1540. René had inherited the title Prince of Orange from his mother's childless uncle. The House of Orange takes its name from the Principality of Orange, based around the city of Orange in southern France. The town was founded by members of the Roman Second Legion in 35 BC as Arusio, named after a local Celtic god. The name Arusio seems to have been corrupted and conflated to the French Orange. The city may have conflated the names due to a connection with oranges, which in the Middle Ages were transported from Spain through the city on their way north. The House of Orange otherwise had no connection to either the fruit or the color until William of Orange, also called William the Silent, began fighting for Dutch independence in the 1500s. It was during this time that the house adopted the color, and it came to represent Protestantism, and the House of Orange fought on the Protestant side during a number of wars of religion. By 1577, William took a tricolor flag of orange, white, and blue as his own. Later, William III of Orange became the King of England with his wife Queen Mary in 1689, and the color orange became an important political statement. Protestants in Catholic-majority Ireland became known as Orange Men, and the color orange remained symbolic of the Dutch monarchy and the Netherlands in general. The Orange Free State in South Africa took its name from the house and used the color in its flag, and the flag of New York City has an orange stripe in honor of its history as a Dutch colony. In England, oranges took on a different cultural heritage in the form of marmalade. Marmalade's origins lie with the quince, a fruit similar in appearance to a pear that was turned into a paste and imported from the Iberian Peninsula. The word marmalade likely comes from the Portuguese word for quince, marmelo. It isn't clear exactly when oranges were first used in marmalades, but a recipe for orange marmalade exists from at least 1677. It seems that with quince paste came barrels of suckets, whole pieces of oranges and other citrus fruit peels that were preserved with sugar. Marmalade came to refer to any kind of fruit preserve, and only took on the specific meaning in England of a citrus preserve much later. There is a legend in Dundee, Scotland, that marmalade was invented by Janet Kyler, mother to James Kyler, who ran a confectionery shop in Seagate. The story goes that a Spanish ship showed up in Dundee Harbor, seeking refuge from a storm. The ship was running behind and was carrying some bitter Seville oranges, which were close to rotting. Kyler bought the cargo, and his mother boiled the peels and combined them with sugar to create marmalade. While it has been definitely proven that they did not invent marmalade, the Kylers and their descendants played an important role in the popularization across the British Isles. 
Janet does seem to have added solid pieces of the peel, creating chip marmalade. Their company became James Kyler and & Son and produced possibly the first commercial marmalade. Marmalade became a popular part of a British breakfast and remains the favorite food of Paddington Bear. In America, the success of the sweet orange industry can largely be attributed to a single type of orange, the navel orange. Almost all citrus trees are infertile, and the creation of hybrids and mutations have made the taxonomy of the various fruits very complex. In general, orange trees are grafted using pieces of existing trees and grafting them onto other rootstock. Naval oranges were born in a monastery in Bahia, Brazil, the result of a genetic mutation attributed to a single tree. The naval orange gets its name from the growth of a second fruit at the apex, which protrudes slightly to appear like a human navel. The Bahia orange had some unique characteristics. It's seedless, has a thicker skin, making it ideal for transport, and it's well suited to more northern climates. The Bahia orange was acquired by a Washington, D.C. grower by 1871. Two of those first trees were sent to Elizabeth Tibbetts, a progressive activist for freedom and women, who moved to California to become a pioneer of the town of Riverside, California. Tibbetts watered her trees with dishwater and nurtured them to health. When the first fruits, which got the name Washington Naval Oranges, were displayed at a fair, they immediately demanded attention. Over the next decade, Tibbetts sold buds to other growers, and it became the dominant orange type in Southern California by 1900. The Bahia was introduced in Florida in 1835, but wasn't successful until the 1870s. Interestingly, at the time, orange juice was not a popular commodity. While oranges have been used for juice for centuries, it requires fresh oranges, and it was difficult to transport the juice any distance because it quickly spoiled. In 1893, growers in Southern California formed a co-op, which became the Sunkissed Growers, Inc. Albert Lasker, called the father of modern advertising, took the Sunkissed account. At the time, overproduction was forcing growers to actually cut down orange trees, but Lasker began the Drink an Orange campaign, selling 10-cent juicers to encourage buyers to juice their own fruits. With the advent of pasteurization and the development of refrigerated rail cars, orange juice became a sensation. Frozen orange juice from concentrate took a little longer. For most in the 1920s, orange juice came in a can. didn't taste very good because pasteurization ruined most of the flavor. By 1941, a very different issue presented itself. Soldiers were sent to war with vitamin C-rich packets of lemon crystals, but they tasted so bad soldiers wouldn't eat them. Meanwhile, cooperatives in Florida began growing more oranges at the behest of the government in an attempt to cushion the effects of rationing. Canned orange juice was brought by the government as a replacement for the lemon crystals, but the government hoped that a better alternative could be created. During the war, Florida cooperatives advertised the importance of vitamin C and surpassed California's largest producer of citrus fruits. By the end of the war, the National Research Corporation, with the support of the government and Florida orange producers, had invented orange juice from concentrate. This is an orange, a choice tree-ripened beauty. The kind snow crop picks right at the peak of perfection to make snow crop frozen orange juice. Researchers found that after boiling, orange juice had lost its flavor, but by adding a little bit of fresh juice afterward, it could be significantly restored. This process of Cutback was patented in 1948 and dubbed Minute Maid. Perhaps the greatest irony of oranges is if that they're grown in tropical zones where it's warm year-round, the right fruit is green and not orange. That has nothing to do with the fruit's ripeness. It has to do with chlorophyll, which is what turns all plants green. But when oranges are subjected to cold weather, like they are in the United States in the spring and in the fall, they usually turn Orange. However, oranges grown, say, primarily in the summer in the U.S. can still be green, and in the U.S. that means that they are deliberately turned orange using a number of different methods. Today, sweet oranges come in a number of different varieties, things like tangerines and valinches and blood oranges and clementines, but they are all descendants of those fruits that were deliberately crossbred in Asia thousands of years ago that have so shaped cultures and history and even our landscape. So similar kind of to how the bananas work, oranges are another one that are, is really interesting and has an ancient history to it. One of the things that actually brought me to oranges was, uh, didn't necessarily have to do with history immediately, but was this idea that there are only a couple of true citrus fruits and most everything else is essentially we've just interbred them to make these different kinds of of citrus fruits and so like one but the, the orange that we understand it the sweet orange is not one of those original citrus fruits and so i thought that was interesting and i wondered hmm how did that happen and that takes us to on this really quite incredible journey of following oranges all over the world and not just 
um, one kind of orange, uh, like the bananas, there are all kinds of different cultivates of it. And the, the oranges, we use quite a few of them today. The bananas, a lot of people, especially in uh, Europe or the United States, like like uh, the history I mentioned, you're only going to have one kind. But we'll have all kinds of citrus fruits from lemons and limes. And sometimes you can find uh, mandarins, clementines, all this kind of stuff. Um, I think it's I just think it's a really, a really interesting way to look at how culture diffuses itself mm -hmm. throughout history um, and not just not just kind of in the way that this fruit has moved physically but in how it has moved and meant so many different things to so many different people mm -hmm. i mean food is such a part of human living that it's a huge part of culture and you know so for example you know a, a shipload of almost rotten banana or uh, rotten bananas rotten oranges shows up in England and so someone buys them and they turn them into marmalade because they're going to go rotten uh, using the using the peel and now England is known for orange marmalade and that is part of English culture and it was just really the coincidence of how they showed up and that that really shows how powerful food connects and, and how, how, how much the history ties to it or because there was an overabundance of oranges and there was this this marketing move to get people to drink an orange uh, and then with refrigeration, then we start, you know, uh, are able to carry orange juice. I mean, it's all, it's all just an extraordinary story about how that became such an important part of culture, something that you just take for granted, that you'd be shocked if you went in the store. I mean, now you'd be shocked if you went in the store in the dead of winter and there weren't oranges in there. And, and how we came to that is just that is a massive story of, of human culture. And some of the things that we think are so very important, uh, you know, whether that's wars or, or, or famines or, 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 or diseases or whatever, the stuff that we think drive, really, when you look at the mundane stuff in life that you deal with every day, uh, that history is really more powerful explanation of what's going on with humanity. So it's another one of those really interesting, compelling stories. And as people moved, they took the, those foods with them. And that's why we have bananas around the world. And that's why we have oranges around the world. And that's why we have different kinds of oranges that didn't exist were it not for people. And really, the, the story uh, behind or the, the video is, is very interesting for the fact that sweet oranges, like we know, and the ones that we really enjoy, were not necessarily the beginning of the story because basically uh, uh, the oranges that the originally were very sour and were not they were not the type of thing that you would eat like we do today. Bitter, yeah, bitter oranges, yeah. I, to be honest, I don't know that I would have really known about bitter oranges. <laughs> That's not the kind of thing you usually walk into a grocery store and find these days. I thought that that was interesting because when I started looking into it, they both have their own significant histories. And the bitter orange was used before and widely before mm -hmm. in all kinds of difference in India and places like that. But it's also to tie in with the marmalade thing we mentioned, you know, that the Seville oranges, this town which is known for oranges and which is literally like the surrounding hills and stuff like that have all have been used specifically to grow oranges for so long that it has defined the whole region. And now Seville has this specific tie to England because almost all the Seville oranges go and make marmalade. History is, is stranger than fiction. It's such a compelling story. And that you can find it, you know, literally under your feet. You can find it in the grocery store. You can find it in the things that you just take for granted every day. It's one of the reasons that uh, that I love history. It's one of the reasons that that we make the history guy. To be curious about all these different things, because I can I can indulge my curiosity on this stuff and then find just the most interesting stuff about things you wouldn't you wouldn't expect. We've we've just really we get so detached from you know you know seven thousand years goes by <laughs> we we forget how this stuff has connected us and i think that that's that's a great way for us to learn about this stuff and to really understand that we we've always had these connections and we need to also appreciate the fact that uh in today's world the fact that you can be in in wherever you're living right now and walk into a grocery store and find leaf lettuce or oranges or bananas uh, I can remember as a, as a little girl, the neatest thing in the world was in the early spring, there would be that uh, the leaf lettuce was available and that you could cut it and you could take it in and eat it. But that's the only time that you could have it. And the first time that I ever saw raspberries in the, in, in the wintertime, while well, you think this is a miracle. Now uh, we see it every day, we accept it every day. And like, uh, like we said, if you know, if you don't find an orange in the grocery store, you think it's strange. But oh my goodness, when you think about how the world has changed and our ability to uh, uh, in the in the farthest corners uh, to find that food is just absolutely astonishing. Yeah. And, absolutely. And, and, and the economics of it are part of how we develop things like refrigerated and 
uh, uh, shipping and things like that. But that also, I mean, it, it's all just so interesting because uh, what we learned with, with bananas and you also learned with oranges, we also learned with apples, is that the cultivars that become popular are the ones that you can ship and transport and store and get to people all around the world to the point where what used to be hundreds of local varieties are not only a handful of varieties that are fit for the way that we sell them. And it's all, again, it's just when you tie food to culture, you understand how much history is connected to, to food. And we learned uh, yeah. uh, they couldn't sell orange juice until they learned how to pasteurize it. And then they couldn't freeze it until they learned they learned that if they put a little bit of fresh orange juice back in, then it was going to taste like orange juice. And so you know, basically the technology as you went along and we learned how to handle foods uh, made all the difference in the world and as, as to how we sold them. So, so, I mean, the food changes the people, the people change the food. Every piece of the, that's, and I mean, I love that about these episodes is that they end up having lots of kind of smaller stories in within them. And that's, that's true. The idea, you know, these days, orange juice is a, a staple of a breakfast kind of thing. And that was something that we had to get to very, I mean, we had to have all this technological stuff to make it even happen because you literally couldn't get and you couldn't get orange juice across the country. But I mean, I'm old enough to remember when when most of the uh, the produce that was at the store had to be seasonal, and and uh, it was uh, you know it's still sometimes surprising to me that it, you can buy watermelons in in December, but you still can't. Yeah. yeah. And 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 that's I mean that didn't used to be even in in my time. Uh, gosh, and I'm I not, agree I'm that that, that it's something we have to remember because you're spoiled. We're spoiled to the fact that and this I mean even myself the the fact that I can go into a store and find this stuff always almost without without no matter what else is going on you can go in and find stuff that the sh the the fact that it's only been in the last i mean really handful of decades that that was true and that's i mean that's amazing it's amazing how much we have changed how much we have advanced and how much we've been able to take it for granted um i and i like one of the things about the orange that is ends up being unique uh, first of all that they're not always orange mm -hmm. um that in the I, I that's who knew that is who knew, mind blowing. A, a, an orange in its natural tropical environment is green when it's ripe. Who knew that? You know, because if you see an orange that's got some green in it, you're like, oh, that's that's nasty. That's not ripe. It's going to be bitter. And it turns out they are artificially oranging the oranges because we've come to expect that oranges will be orange. And because it, it has nothing to do that was that was interesting too. It has nothing to do with their ripeness. It's all about how where they mature how and much, stuff like that. Chlorophyll, yeah, and and in you know, yeah. the cold climates, and they don't get the chlorophyll, and, and so the, the the peel doesn't get. Uh, but if you handed me a green orange, I just feel like I don't know what I would do with that. I'd be like, Am yeah, I supposed is, to is this, this a lie? <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> um, but then it, oranges have the you know the sidebar of color, mm -hmm. and I think that that's I thought when I had first started this that there was going to be a. a that it was going to be more difficult to determine which came first, the color or the or the fruit, because like, you know, when you're I remember even when I was younger being like, oh, which came f first? I don't know. Uh, but it's it's actually like really simple. And it's that we have we know when they when the fruit came and what we were calling it. And then we know that we didn't use that word to describe the color for like another 200 years. Well, and uh, that we didn't that's, really that's, have a word to describe the color. That is just it is absolutely fascinating. So so I mean, humans change oranges and then oranges change human language because they come to define that piece of human language that i mean that is you know your your, primary, your colors are a significant part of your language it's it's really really fascinating how those how those interacted and it's i mean i think yeah, there's yeah. probably lots of people sat around and said you know they call it an orange because it's orange or or they call it orange because it's the color of oranges uh, and it's interesting to find not only did oranges come first but that actually oranges aren't orange except when we started growing oranges where oranges weren't supposed <laughs> to grow yeah that's all of that is just it's it's an incredible story of like how could all of that have happened and yet it all had to in order for us to just experience the everyday thing of describing yeah, and it's every, we absolutely orange. take it for granted no one ever i don't i don't know anybody in the modern world in the united states is thinking about our oranges supposed to be orange or or you know did we know what orange was before we had oranges and if we'd never gone to oranges out Unreal. of the tropical environment would i mean would we even have a color for orange or would, it or be would we just call red? it red yellow it, it makes me wonder how that kind of stuff must uh, affect us too is because i guess if you don't have a, if you don't have you know really a reason to describe the color you don't and i i heard that i was hearing that about blue is that blue is actually like a very rare color in nature and a lot of stuff that you know like we draw or color as blue is is only kind of arguably blue like the ocean is is blue when we paint it <laughs> but if you're you know sitting in front of an ocean it's maybe maybe less yeah, blue than you would think yeah and so that's that's just kind of an interesting 
idea that we have the color orange existed this whole time there were flowers that were orange and uh, the sunsets and stuff like that but we just didn't have a word for it until the fruit came along that's it's just really interesting to me that 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 kind of stuff because how do you go back and think oh the time before orange was invented <laughs> <laughs> like that doesn't make any sense <laughs> yeah, so, is there um, a neanderthologist sort of standing there saying what is that <laughs> what is that i don't know when are they going to invent that <laughs> <laughs> I can't see the That's, sunset because we haven't found yeah. the fruit yet. We have. <laughs> So we can't that we can't describe it. But that's just that's really interesting to me is that I guess, yeah, there was a time before there were any words for colors. And you don't really think that there had to there had to be stuff that kind of prompted us to define those colors. Um, so I think we've kind of talked about, you know, how these how each of these fruits can end up defining particular locations culture and so it's it's amazing that we have what bananas mean to americans is very different from places in the tropics where they've got dozens or hundreds of varieties of bananas and that's or places I mean, that's, in sub-saharan africa where is your primary staple of food yeah that's incredible that's that's stuff that you just never would have thought of and i, I just think that we've i think that it's really cool that we're able to tell these kinds of stories on our channel. I think that that's one of the things that's important about what we, uh, that I find important about what we do, because it's it's just the kind of stuff that is completely forgotten. And we have to, the researching these episodes is always interesting. Sometimes when you're doing like a particular event, you know, you can come, you can kind of bring together all of the sources. Uh, these ones always require so many sources because each yeah, piece and again, it is, it's goes different story. directions. But I mean, it's fun. I mean, this job is fun because you learn stuff every time that you do it. And if people don't know, I, I wrote the banana episode. Josh wrote the orange episode. We do have a, a Josh and I write the, the bulk of the episodes. And we've had a few other people that. Wrote them. And that is uh, uh, that is one of the one of the best things about doing what we do is that we're here to uh, to help the viewers learn. And uh, so I, our story has always been to write what you want to write, write stuff that you'd want to watch. And if, if it's interesting when we, we're, we're researching it, then probably it's going to be interesting when people hear it. And that's, that's why we like to do what we do. And that's, that's why you can get such a variety of things off of the history guy. I mean, we, we enjoy talking about something different every, every other day. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.